Hello everyone, today we talk about the 11th century crisis of the Byzantine Empire. So this is a very interesting topic for a number of reasons, and the most important one is strictly historiographical and methodological, and it has to do with the problem of defining crisis, right? And being able to assess objectively a uh, change, a radical, a sudden, mostly um, detrimental change in two societies that in time are very, very um, <clears throat> far from us, in this sense they are also culturally speaking, at least up to a certain point. And the history of the Roman Empire during the Middle Ages is definitely one of the most uh, hotly debated by the same Byzantinistics in these regards, because objectively the Byzantine Empire had this series of uh, pretty tough of blows time after time that surely didn't, uh, you know, didn't do particularly good to it, but that also had this incredible resilience, you know, this ability to withstand avalanches of enemy peoples, sieges of the same capital, um, constant warfare ongoing the frontier, and uh, very, uh, you know, very in difficult internal challenges as well, mm -hmm. and uh, that actually uh, highlight the solidity of this empire, right? Um, so here we're not going to make a story of, you know, the idea of what is the Byzantine Empire, what you call it, Roman or Byzantine, or nor um, <clears throat> making a general idea on the concept of decadence, which is largely abused, uh, I can tell. Uh, it's uh, largely uh, a stereotype, a preconception about the empire that uh, definitely had its own characteristics that probably on the long run didn't quite help, but that hey, lasted up to the mid-15th century from from the same Roman Empire, which 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 was really, uh, depending on whether you want to consider it, have been founded by Constantine, ideally speaking, in this particular uh, Aegean and Pontic uh, dimension, but uh, essentially it's uh, an organism that has an incredibly long life, um, it's always a risk to, to deal with uh, things like human uh, political and social uh, groups in, in biological terms, as if, you know, it was um, a teleological development on how uh, these entities um, transform over time. It's not really like that. And, and this is what, however, makes, because it's, you know, in this case of politics and society, it's enormously more complicated than that, and this testifies as I was saying before, <clears throat> for the solidity of this system, right? And we've made several videos about Byzantine history, actually, if you're interested, there is a whole playlist dedicated to it, also Byzantine warfare, who is interested in military history. Um, so I won't be repeating myself on certain topics that we already touched, we don't make a lot of inter big deal of introduction of what the, the Roman Empire at this point was, etc. But we're talking about this century, the 11th one, right? It is one of the moments of crisis, right? Uh, the main moments of crisis of the empire are fundamentally the 7th century. Uh, the 11th definitely uh, witnesses pretty pretty dramatic changes. Um, <clears throat> eventually with the crusader sack of Constantinople 1204, there is the, the, real, the real decadence, the real disruption in many ways, even though I've met some pretty acute Byzantinists who were um, we're, we're, we're still possibilists um, in terms of certain uh, strategical options that the Empire had even after um, the, the Palaiologoi's uh, reconquest, basically, of Constantinople itself at the end of the 13th century. But the 11th century is uh, a very um, <clears throat> fascinating century. It's basically the uh, the core of the same Byzantine history. It's the moment of the rise of the Comnenian dynasty at the end of the Macedonian period. Uh, it's this moment that is, is interpreted uh, actually in different ways and that poses us the problem saying, you know, was this real crisis? You know, what, what had happened here? How were things changing? Were they changing really just for better, for worse? What was going on? And it's a bit of an iconic moment because the 11th century is the great moment of revival of European uh, growth um, and expansions, and expansion, sorry, and um, it's it's the central phase of the Middle Ages, is uh, especially from a strictly, you know, narrowly Western European, let's say, better perspective that I can, you know, relate to uh, personally, uh, is um, 
definitely a moment of growth, right? And this is true, and but it's very important to distinguish uh, between growth and expansion because um, what general medievistics talks about is the fact that in from from this century onwards, from you know, the eleventh to twelfth, etc. Uh, basically, Western Europe, so basically Latin Germanic Europe, started emerging uh, not just as a, a growing force quantitatively, but also as an expansive one. That is a force that is able not just to augment itself in terms of quantity, but of quality and capabilities of you know consolidating the expansion. And this goes at several levels, from a military point of view. Um, also from a cultural point of view, I mean, that takes a bit of a time, but there are very important ways you can look at uh, Western European culture at this point, and definitely the commercial one as well. And these are all, um, say, models that interact with, with the Byzantine Empire, with Islam as well, um, and that, though, uh, it seems, were... <clears throat> uh, uh, different, a little different, uh, or a, bit, a lot different, actually, from what was happening to these last worlds. Because in, in those, you can witness growth. Um, <clears throat> what can seem of an expansion by a certain degree, but effectively, on the long run, the expansive element was seemingly much uh, more contained than the what, what happened with West. And uh, the 11th century is, in this sense, very important because it's the, the main crisis, the main blow that the, the, the empire takes is definitely the loss of uh, Anatolia that was basically the, the core land of the military resources of the empire from which uh, the Byzantines drew their uh, famed and dreaded uh, cavalry that was, you know, some of the most advanced of the time. So the Seljuks after the defeat of Manzikert uh, after vic their own victory of Manzikert against on the Byzantines I made a three hours video on the Battle of Manzikert. If you're interested that can help to give also some background um, not just between the relation uh, between Byzantines and, and, and Seljuks but also the role that Westerners had in that point that is sometimes overlooked especially in terms of mercenaries that pre-exist definitely even the Crusades etc um, and, um, and, and this is you know uh, but there is the approach with the West as well you know, the, there are the Normans that are extremely aggressive from southern Italy. They launch deep raids. They are able to defeat the Byzantines in open field and to sack um, Thessalonica, that was basically the second city of the empire that already in the past had been um, basically taken by certain Greco Saracen uh, pirates. So um, it's a moment of of great problems that start emerging basically from all sides. Now, this is very important, because when you look at these powers, historically speaking, uh, more than highlighting differences, I think it's useful at the beginning to uh, understand what, what really they had in common, right? So, uh, there were certain conditions of relative parity, also in, the lo in terms of local productions, uh, production and, and uh, uh, growth rate, etc. So, um, <clears throat> when you look at sheer big, like having a, an open frontier, or even more than one at a time, it's an enormous cost at this point for every empire involved. There are no infinite resources at this time. Uh, there is still, in spite of all, a very low growth rate, in spite this is increasing. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, lots of things that eventually happened at this point, are framed into this general sense of crisis, saying, you know, uh, in a certain way, the <coughs> the empire was doomed at this point, or it had some intrinsic qual characteristics for which such uh, big territorial losses and defeats had uh, to to occur, you know, where or not. Um, <coughs> and when you start studying this events in detail, right, um, the you you realize that by the degree of uh, of, of uh, probability that certain things would happen were incredibly low, impredictable, uh, often related to ever-changing political balances and choices, etc. So, um, even individual choices, right? Even great battles like Manzikert himself or Meriokephalon later in the 12th century is also the, the other big blow. Um, alleged big blow, right? Because this is what we're trying to, to observe here. Nobody wants to deny 
the the evident loss of one of the most important um, <clears throat> regions of the empire. But at the same time, you have to to look also at how the empire reacted, how um, objectively even Seljuk power on in a few decades would simply fragment itself. It was happening on a frontier that was a frontier both for the Byzantines and for the Seljuks. Uh, they, they were definitely powers that were expanding in those areas, but at the same time, the, the, the stability was somewhat loose, especially from the Seljuk side. So even sometimes the the impact that Manzikert had, for example, in triggering the Crusades has been overly exaggerated, right? Especially by the mid-90s of the 11th century, when the Seljuks basically weren't much of a threat anymore, and especially for the Westerners. Um, and so, but looking at, in fact, how objectively things could have gone differently from the same event, but also how the reaction uh, took place. And uh, if you look at the Byzantine Empire, you realize that over time, for example, by the Battle of Meriokephalon in, in the in the following century, basically the Byzantines had regained kind of most of certain territories that had been lost. They had managed to frame even certain uh, Muslim uh, emirates of the Anatolian plateau under their command. They had proceeded step by step, town by town, um, <clears throat> trying to reacquire, and, and with a logic that has to be understood also in, in, in terms of internal trade routes, the centrifugal pushes that, for example, certain coastal towns of the Byzantine Empire, uh, especially in Anatolia, like Trebizond, etc., um, or Antalya, this, uh, had uh, because the, the loss of the uh, plateau uh, had brought to uh, progressive autonomization of coastal towns because the inner routes across Anatolia now were cut off by these uh, emirates that mostly, you know, tried to trade, in fact, themselves with the Byzantines, but, you know, were sometimes so unstable that there were all these moral years, etc., that uh, made those nets insecure. So a main goal of the Byzantines was to regain that territory, albeit some uh, parts of its um, uh, uh, you know, productivity had been lost uh, in order to re-strengthen these internal bonds, for example, and, and therefore having an impact even on these political dynamics that were happening within the, the cities of the empire. This is interesting because, for example, um, a pretty frequent criticism that you hear is that you know, once the Anatolian plateau was lost, it wasn't such, you know, the effort that the Byzantines put between the 11th and the 12th century to regain those lands were kind of, uh, you know, useless because, you know, those areas had turned into something very different from the Seljuk. Uh, after the Seljuk conquest, they had turned fundamentally into pastoralism. The Byzantine dams and, and irrigation systems had basically collapsed because the, the Seljuks didn't have a centralized direction. And so those uh, territories were kind of lost forever, even in terms of productivity. But, you know, this lacks completely. It's a mechanistic, sometimes even technologistic idea of what a, a power by the 11th century really was and which uh, elements was really relying, right? Uh, so you can use many, uh, just even dialectical methods to to set a, uh, you know, a pretty solid pattern of criticism against kind of both interpretations. And it's fair. It's fair, because the, the whole thing was pretty damn complex. We know very few about it, and uh, you know, what, were we there? No, we weren't. <laughs> and and therefore, things are very, very difficult to uh, reframe. Not, naturally, a, a big deal of, you know, of... Um, th th there are so many other indicators that now we can't list, also because I'm not a Byzantinist myself, I don't, I don't know much about... Um, I made an exam once on uh, Manu Manuel I, Comnenus, uh, that book by Magdalino, was uh, extremely interesting and in that dealt with this thing. And, and the, the image that emerges from there is that objectively by the 12th century, you know, the empire was still a, a real might, had proven, even after the 11th century crisis, incredible uh, resorting capabilities and uh, this aggressive, uh, uh, you know, capabilities that went wrong but for for example in in Italy or and, and also in in Anatolia uh, but that could have really gone otherwise if they had gone otherwise they they might have really changed a lot of things 
by the 12th century, the Byzantines were, uh, were one step away from, uh, for example, annihilating the secular Normans in southern Italy. They failed because of lack of coordination, uh, objective Norman capability at that point. But it was uh, a plausible scenario to have a decentralized Byzantine uh, southern Italy, uh, where also the papacy would have had some, you know, some uh, share, uh, and um, and a, a whole different uh, history also for the history of the church. There might have been easily uh, the end of the schism of the 11th century. Uh, the same goes for the Battle of Mirio Califon. Battle of Mirio Califon in 1176 uh, is pretty interesting because the uh, you know if you look at the few sources that there are in that there is this narrative that Manuel was you know kind of uh, doing something dumb. He was listening just to the astrologers and uh, made this you know advance into this narrow path where the the, the Seljuks were uh, of Iconium were waiting for him. And not because the Byzantine army wasn't a strong one or a capable one. And then this, there's this defeat with all of this also historiographical models and cliches, etc. Then when you study things like diplomatic sources, you realize, for example, that uh, Frederick Barbarossa was con uh, contemporary to the events after the Battle of Meriokephalon received two letters. The first one was from Manuel, from, from the Byzantines. Um, and the other one from um, the uh, uh, the Sultan of Iconium that was fighting the war at that point. And it's very interesting because Merikathanon has already happened. So theoretically, the Byzantines have already been defeated. But apparently it's not so because we know that military operations were going on after even one year. And at one point, even Iconium had to be basically... Uh, abandoned by by the Muslims because the Byzantines were even still around. It's quite a big deal. So because Iconium is, you know, substantial center, it's the capital, the Sultanate of Rome. It's quite of a power. And in these two uh, letters that the the German emperor receives, there is from from one side, uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously the Byzantines said that they're winning, and uh, the the Muslims are saying they're winning, and they're probably both bluffing because the, the thing was undecided but it was a big deal of the time to play in this even international relations to presume like look we here we are winning we are losing because it was such an internationally uh, intertwined problem matter that even fake news uh, like uh, political propaganda has always been about very functionally very cleverly very effectively uh, did make a difference. So it was the small things sometimes that could really change. And, and even after Mario Kefalon, it doesn't seem that there is this massive crisis of the empire at all, right? People say, ah, oh, Mario Kefalon brought a, the point to to the weakness of the empire that uh, made it fall to 1204. Really? Really? Where's the proof of that? Have you ever studied society in those decades and tell me, you know, that, that there was a society in crisis? It doesn't seem so at all. Uh, do you know that, objectively, the Crusaders had been called by the same Byzantines to Constantinople? I mean, th there is so much to tell about these stories that uh, it's almost embarrassing how easily we, 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 we look at these narratives and we present them and we fundamentally believe in them. Because it's natural to, to have a historical narrative, because otherwise <laughs> you couldn't tell history. But uh, things are way more complicated, basically all the time. And uh, until you get on the sources, it's it's very very difficult to to look at. And in fact, there is still <coughs> excuse me a, a, a long debate today. I would like to stick to the 11th century, but uh, it's obvious that tendentially uh, we 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 look at the long run and we say that, that there is this phase essentially between the 11th century and the beginning of the 13th that are a bit of something on its own in this historiographical repetition. And uh, the, the narrative that is often given is uh, the empire at this point crystallizes itself at the point that it, it crumbles against these new forces that were emerging from the West, especially. Because let's be concrete at this time. At this point, the major threat of the empire is not the East, it's not the Muslims, it's really the West, right? Who is much more expansive and aggressive and uh, it ha has new forces that are you know, never seen are unpreceded uh, uh, in that area of Europe that are emerging and going all around. Uh, but tell, 
telling the truth, actually, the empire was really changing in a way that can't be really seen only as crisis, of course, but that um, makes you understand that that world was changing as well. So the, the, the point is, uh, naturally, right? So the point is that the business empire wasn't that crystallized as we think. It had its own models, it definitely had certain limits, as we were saying before, but it also had the capability of any great power of the time that had really a, a, a huge dimension, still in control, very wide and solidly uh, populated and economically dyna dynamic areas. Uh, <coughs> I don't remember how it was handing. However, as um, an empire that was capable of changing by itself, and, and that especially was turning uh, towards a model that is much more resemblant, in fact, of the one of the West, that has an incredible, and that's where the expansive cap capabilities of the West are proven, right? Because the West, in this sense, influences a lot, both the Byzantine world and even the Islamic world, actually. The idea of feudalism, right? That um, is the strongest in the West, and therefore, into which the uh, the, the West has this leading role, right? But at the same time, this transformation can be seen also as an internal dynamic of the same empire. Think about the Pronoia system, right? It was essentially a, a Byzantine feudalism, to tell it very simply, albeit it was much different in the sense that it still cooperated with a robust centralized power. Uh, even if though by centralized we still have to mean, especially at this point, something that had mm, undergone, you know, the, the state had s kind of collapsed in part, you know, the the, the the empire was ruled, especially with the Comnenians, with this private clientele. So, we're, yeah, they were concentrated in Constantinople, they were a, a very narrow elite, they, they still held control of, of the state proper, but that were evolving, in fact, from something very different to what they had been before, especially in Macedonian times, there had been a pretty strong effort to to revive the state proper, like a truly centralized system to stem the rise of the land estate owners and to, uh, you know, to create this um, bureaucracy of functionaries, etc., that actually they were the ones that uh, turned their backs to the same central power and they they were corrupted by the land estate owners that at this time in in, in Comnenian, the Comnenian period are instead uh, uh, at at the top ruling, right? So the Comnenians were some, you know, the product of a failure of the Macedonian times in some way, right? And this transformation occurred also because of several different, even dynastic uh, reasons, right? There were certain sovereigns that could have done much better had they had more luck or more time. Mm -hmm. uh, so these aspects are very, very important too. So uh, there is a lot of debate, right, on whether how the, the Byzantine Empire might have uh, kept expanding. And much of this is seemingly being recognized as already taking place as a sort of further feudalization or even westernization, if you want, of the empire. It's particularly evident uh, under Manuel uh, I in the, in the second half of the 12th century. Um, and it actually seems a great response. I mean, while society is basically moving towards a, one direction that at this point can't be reversed anymore, well, probably the best at that point is not to struggle against it, but if anything, to ride the wave and to try to to master that in a way that can build something more consistent, right? Also, in terms of military power, like now the Westerners had their own feudal retinues that were pretty efficient political and military model. It had its own flows, but at the same time, it was somewhat less machinous and more effective and more. Uh, functional uh, than the decentralized system with the state, with the general levy and the uh, etc. So, and this is very interesting because as we were saying before, the Byzantines were starting to hire an, uh, an ever greater number of Western mercenaries and uh, they, they were doing that since ever. Actually, even the same call for help after Manzikert to Western Christianity wasn't obviously about the Crusades, they were compl something completely outside every possible, you know, uh, fantasy of, of, of the 
Byzantine mentality, uh, and rightfully, given the, the, the internal order that existed within Constantinople, uh, and the, the Orthodox tradition, and etc., but it was just calling basically more mercenaries, like the ones that had already been there, like starting from the Vikings and then, then eventually this uh, adventurers, mostly from, usually it was from southern Italy, so from, from the Normans, um, and uh, but also from, there were plenty, even from, from the rest of Italy, from, from France, um, later on there are, <coughs> there were the Germans as well, so um, this is important because it means also something positive about it. It means that the empire can attract a lot of uh, manpower by wealth, right? The the empire does work at this point as a big clientele that can hire troops, effective knights, etc. They are incredibly loyal. Let, let's be honest about this. That mercenary forces at this point are some of the most effective and loyal troops ever. Like the myth of the mercenary that is just uh, betrayal. Uh, master uh, is is a 19th century national uh, romantic uh, prejudice, but at this point, uh, war is made through mercenaries. It, it starts increasing doing that, and especially, probably, the, it would be interesting to compare how the the two, you know, at which stages both the 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 the, the Latins, let's say, and the Greeks were um, were doing that, meaning that obviously they, they corresponded to two different models, but uh, it's obvious that even in the rise of uh, of Western chivalry, etc., the, the, the experience in the Mediterranean the Byzantine service is very, very important. Think about Harald or Trada, um, uh, the, the king of Norway. He had served uh, into, into the Byzantine's campaign uh, for reconquering uh, Sicily, um, and that's uh, the one that dies at Stamford Bridge, uh, puts an end, you know, put, and w together with the uh, with the Viking era, etc. But th these are glob trotters, and that's what mercenaries do, and that's what contractors do. And that, that still happens every day, today, right? And 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 those are still effective, and that's how war basically is all about. But just think about all the exchange of military techniques. Uh, yesterday we were talking, for example, about 12th century Scandinavian uh, uh, equipment fundamentally. And uh, we're observing the, the the spread of the kite shield, the uh, the drop shield. Uh, there is a, an incredible share of, of 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 even of material culture, technical know-how about panoplies, etc. That you can't find in the Byzantine Empire, in Ottonian uh, Germany, in in uh, uh, French Normandy. So there is really a lot of this stuff going around that imply. Uh, a much stronger relation between these systems that, and a, and a much greater similarity that is often uh, believed, right? So we have the stereotypes, like of the Byzantines are kind of uh, weird, uh, unflexible, uh, traditionalist, and uh, pomp, you know, you know, ceremonious. Uh, but uh, reality, you know, people are kind of it's the same everywhere. Certain dynamics are mostly you. When you have to look at differences, is uh, who held what in terms of property of, of money and what the balance was right and the west objectively is is more um, egalitarian in the sense it's more competitive it's more you know being more politically fragmented it's not weaker this is also important as feudalism in practice is not weaker the, the byzantines uh, realized this and uh, and by their own omission, <laughs> let's say. Even they, they didn't explicitate it, but they were starting objectively to rely on, on the resources and on the models that the West was presenting them. Right. If anything, because when you you fight also against someone you tend to become similar to that person. To share something deep, important, culturally speaking. Uh, so looking at this Debate. Uh, the, uh, the 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 first thing that sparks a bit of perplexity is that there had been a uh, previously to the eleventh century a, a rather happy, accomplished work of restoration of the empire, of re-expansion is often very not, uh, really not this um, talked much. You know, obviously, who studies Byzantine history knows these things, but 
you know, this phase, especially of the 9th to the 10th centuries, is crucial uh, for the strengthening of the empire, for re-expanding. And uh, it had uh, started essentially from the times of Michael III and uh, accomplished under the ensuing Macedonian uh, dynasty. And the success that you can spot in there is the ideological adaptation of the uh, doctrinal autonomy reached, for example, through the clash against the uh, the pictures during uh, iconoclasm by the ecclesiastical organism, uh, the spread, religious and cultural spread of Greek orthodoxy and its support, imperial support within and beyond the political territorial boundaries of the empire had been the reconquest of all the regions located south of the Danube. That's also very important as a frontier that uh, it, it was controlled, could, could really consolidate also all the areas that were south that had at this point like hundreds of kilometers into the Balkanic interland that you know, were kind of a frontier on their own and could uh, protect uh, like a stripe uh, the the other territories just by being there you know um, it's important to connect territories it's important to um, to have this um, ability of uh, protecting uh, regions by shielding them with other regions that's why expansion that is also um, over expansion is some critique that has been expressed towards this Byzantine fort is like, ah, yeah, this thing overly expanded, it was so so expansive, and uh, it, it, it eventually damaged the reconquest. Well, it's not really true, because if you look at what every single empire did at the time, uh, that was it, right? So, uh, the, re the only reason why other powers somewhat did it in less uh, clamorous and successful way and the Byzantines had done at this point is that because they were more politically fragmented that is weaker uh, on a broader level um, it is true that maybe an internal consolidation might have been uh, more plausible but uh, by experience I can't say that at that point the, in a world where the, the crop rate is so low if you're really gonna wait just for the surplus to to make it you know course and you know sedimentic etc well the enemies are gonna eat you alive right because you're surrounded by enemy and we have seen how also through our phone calls of its video how detrimental it is to to give the initiative to the enemy uh, to leave the initiative to the enemy so uh, looking for a military expansion sometimes was not even an option uh, telling the truth but because when you're fighting against certain peoples especially in the frontiers that are rassy all the time uh, you 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 necessarily need to make them stop. So you need for the big battle, and you hope to crush them in one shot. Think about Basil the Second that annihilated the, the the Bulgarians, for example. It had been always this pain in the behind in the northern frontier. Now they 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 were taken away. I mean, these are big accomplishments, like massive accomplishments. Uh, they're not to be overlooked, and they surely um, had an impact, a beneficial impact on the fate of the empire. So, no, right? You know, while you when you seize finally another region, you have much more surplus overall. It's not just about the local resources, uh, agricultural resources that are the base of all economy. It's really about the interconnection of all, all the provinces that you have. It's free trade. It's controlling the trade routes that pass throughout all these regions under one one single control, right? Uh, then, of course, at that point, uh, the, the, the problems are shifted at a higher level, meaning that you, you start acquiring more resources than you did, so you, you have uh, bigger options, but in this sense also more risky options. You know, the bigger the, the enterprise is, is, and more things can go wrong, but if they do go well, you know, that's a worth, uh, a worth bet, fundamentally. And, and that's what you see what the Byzantines are doing with the rest of his territories, right? So when you look at the reconquest that uh, that had occurred this Macedonian times, for example, the one of Apulia in the west, uh, that's quite a thing. Uh, 
albeit Sicily, for example, had been lost in parallel, right? In the east, you you find the penetration in uh, the Byzantine penetration in Armenia and in Syria, and the subtraction um, uh, of Crete and Cyprus to the Muslims. These are big accomplishments, right? The loss of Sicily is important because. Uh, that's quite an important maritime base uh, at the center of the Mediterranean, and it's quite of a um, interesting land to to control because you have many options from there. It's very fertile, etc. But it's lost at one point, um, and also in there because of you know certain factors that might have easily gone in a different way, right? Uh, Apulia is this fertile region, very fertile region in southeastern Italy that uh, makes me a bit more perplex in terms of uh, actual um, effective, effectiveness of the conquest because eventually was, as we'll see now, was would be lost once again to, to the Normans. But objectively, because first of all it's across the sea, right? You have to cross the Ionian Sea, so that requires all of a uh, important naval and logistical effort, etc. It's objectively an isolated, you know, not really isolated, but, you know, a land that is surrounded by potential competitors. At this point, there are still the Longobard Duchess there that are not much of a power, telling the truth, but obviously they're not happy that the Byzantines are there. They are in the mountains, and uh, Apulia is kind of a flat land. So there are some strategic problems posed also by the fact that there is the papacy that in Italy, wants, especially in the south, wants to recover as much as possible, exploding this political fragmentation. There is the Holy Roman Empire that obviously doesn't want uh, its rule over Italy to be challenged by the, uh, the the Byzantines, and there is a lot of attrition in there. But it's still, you know, solid land that at that point has several ports that can trade with one of the peers of Greece. Um, it's important also because uh, of the alliance with Venice that we will talk. Uh, a little bit in a while, because technically speaking, Venice is part of the, of the empire. Um, the penetration in Armenia and Syria is um, somewhat, um, let's say, debatable, especially when uh, we talk about Manzikert. I was seeing it a couple of months ago, exactly, looking at the map. I don't know how excessively clever, I mean... Uh, if you look at the territories around the Lake Van and where Manzikert is, you know, that was aimed at the, the Byzantines had expanded there. There was, was not much there proper. There was basically a set of fortresses that were relatively isolated because they're not so close to Anatolia. Anatolia is solidly uh, Byzantine, right? It's also relatively easy to defend. The expansion of the Byzantines into the depth of Armenia could objectively open to them the uh, access to the Tigris Valley, it was the ultimate strategic effort, and this had to work like a pincer movement in Syria, uh, where eventually, however, you know, things were, were, were lost once again, Antioch would be lost, uh, the Cilician, uh, Cilician Ar Armenians would be settled, this is this frontier sometimes even before Manziker telling the truth, the eastern frontier had been difficult to control. Um, many Kurds, for example, had settled in Anatolia, sneaked through the, uh, through the... I mean, they simply settled, also because there was no real border, right? You know, it was a pretty in-depth kind of uh, defense. So all these kind of, same, you know, pastoral peoples that you know, were settling, spreading to... Uh, they sometimes it, it was also positive because they could be taxed and then, but at the same time it, it also proves some lack of direct control, and it, it further expanding hundreds inland into these mountainous territories, uh, is, you know, is a bit risky at the end of the day, and that's where in fact Manziker occurs as a disaster, um, but and and Anatoly is lost as a consequence. Um, very important were instead the reconquest of Crete and Cyprus, in my opinion, from the Muslims. Um, this naturally had been uh, Byzantine lands up to the Arab invasions. Then it was very important, especially uh, for Crete, to be into the control of the Byzantines. Crete would become a sort after the Byzantine reconquest, a sort of uh, private imperial uh, possession. 
like all uh, a solid amount of uh, uh, imperial personal production of resources of goods etc to import to Constantinople came from Crete also Cyprus was very important it's a very important logistical base where you can strike a bit throughout all the the Levantine Sea uh, into Syria into to Egypt in fact it would be particularly important during the Crusades because because of this uh, role so conquering these two islands and also the surrounding ones in the Aegean means to close the Aegean Sea it's very important now it's all Byzantine and you don't risk uh, Saracen pirates that strike here and there like it had happened with Thessalonica for example so these are this secure uh, role uh, the, the Byzantines had also secured the um, Christianization, the, the Orthodox Christianization of the Russians, of the Rus, that were at this point uh, strategic partners of the Byzantines, uh, at the least. Uh, so the control of you know the Black Sea trade was particularly important for the the yeah the, the supplies of Constant for Constantinople was quite an important feat. So. Uh, the <coughs> excuse me the empire has somewhat consolidated in in the middle and tries this further ex uh, expansion to counter what the uh, uh, ex uh, external enemies of this area could be uh here comes the criticism because people say oh well but all of these enterprises of the macedonian emperors had required uh something more than just the expenditure of resources they had uh, from a, a sheer operational point of view they had changed society in the process right there had been a centralization of, of military forces at offensive ends right uh, that was that had needed at that point a, a large employment of mercenaries of every origin basically and, and this had changed quite a lot uh, having these professionals that uh, dwell into a world that is almost about co basically continuous warfare is more of a necessity than than an option uh, the the local population if they pay taxes to the work the land they, they don't want to go to war that, that uh, eagerly so uh, it, it's kind of intelligent and, and profitable to simply hire mercenaries in the meanwhile because they're more they're particularly readily available as we've seen is plenty of westerners everywhere everywhere uh, in the east at this point uh, you can hire them uh, very very easily uh, and the uh, so was there an option in the first place probably not uh, but it's been highlighted the contrast that that this military organization had with the uh, mostly uh, prevalently defensive uh, regime of the teams right that uh, 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 that was the base uh, the the basically the, the administrative military and fiscal base in which the empire had been uh, parceled and that uh, was based on the old idea that there had to be a local militia fundamentally a local Byzantine army that was associated to these teams and that could be eventually joined but that had also created problems let's not forget about this that you know there had been revolts uh, more than once these um, certain of these uh, teams that um, you know some that had even needed brought the, the empire to the emperor to build his own kind of private army uh, permanently sh stationed in Constantinople we I think we discussed this on the video on the Nic Nicophorian cataphracts uh, because it was talking about partially also that that kind of administration and increasingly distrusting the uh, the most uh, external teams that traditionally uh, you know the, the could uh, would be more uh, autonomistically oriented and that w were naturally also more difficult to control uh, at a longer distance. So these are factors that altogether seem, uh, you know, pretty unavoidable <laughs> to to have a, a developed in this direction. You know, 
Uh, and yet, it's obvious that uh, such uh, great military expenses had um, had uh, achieved, in fact, such broader uh, strategic results, but at the same time had increased uh, uh, a lot taxes, tax needs, and detentions, in fact, between the imperial power and a bureaucratic aristocracy that tended to a more based social base of, of, of recruitment, and also the, arist the military aristocracy that could count in clientele in expansion. So, as we were saying before, I under Macedonian times there had been an attempt to reduce the, uh, the impact of the landed uh, aristocracy, these great latifundia owners, basically, that were in the countryside, were swallowing the, the uh, small and middle uh, owners, basically. And uh, there had been laws that had done, you know, that, that uh, ter uh, land could not be expropriated, that there had to be all a, a precedence, basically, um, a, a set of levels that, you know, land had to go preferably to many other uh, type of of owners before then the, the landed uh, aristocracy that already had enormous power. But all these efforts were kind of to uh, mechanicistic and uh, to um, I don't know dirigist I don't know how to say that but you know it uh, practically couldn't stem the expansion of this larger and broader clientele. So in a way the Comnenians are the uh, the same blending into the system, right? They rule through the military clientele, right? And they are objectively warriors by themselves. They they are. Uh, burst into this character that, um, in fact, brings to a sort of uh, chivalrization of Byzantine culture. You know, even if you look at Byzantine music, that probably Byzantine music, by definition, is only the, the ecclesiastical one, right? But uh, there, were, there was also some secular music that was instead coming from external references, and you can see this uh, courtois. Um, culture spreading from places like Provence, like the West, uh, that brought together with it, uh, the, the chivalric ideals, you know, look at the Akritai, the, uh, the basically those who lived into these castles, like castellanes, basically, like but, but like the German ministerialists, etc., they were living like Western feudal lords. Um, and they were developing this taste even for Western models and even in equipment, military equipment, etc. So it was a deep change into the same, the very fabric of Byzantine uh, politics and society. And this is important because this can be effectively interpreted as a moment of crisis, right? But it's a crisis of certain models that are already surpassed, which means that. The Byzantine civilization has the ability to change, right? Has the potential uh, of for, for for making a further step. Now, the real problem are the elites, because at this point, the elites have become, in fact, so elites <laughs> that uh, they won't give up certain models uh, that they have. They retain as in a strong traditionalist and conservative way that also the Comanians embody largely um, of the you know truest Byzantine pride and culture that are somewhat snobbish towards whichever thing doesn't belong to the tradition and that's where you can objectively find the disclaritization but at the same time that is the product of the elite so what we see uh, largely, uh, more largely, in the sense that obviously the elite produced more and wanted to portray, uh, had the means uh, to portray itself in a way that other classes didn't, right? But tendencies are different. So it, it sometimes enlightened emperors, like for example Manuel I, that I like so much thanks to, to that uh, Byzantine history exam, that had, they understood clearly what was going on and try to fight and to to change this to to set uh, to trigger some new mechanisms that could uh, more or less intentionally make the empire transition into this 
other models. They were chiefly feudalism. They were chiefly feudalism, as we were saying before. That at, w at one point, especially by the 13th century, is definitely not a bad option looking around you, right? Um, and it's obvious that in, in this process, uh, there's a bit of a, a, a hypocr of a hypocrisy because paradoxically it was the same ruling class coming from the military aristocracies that had ruined and dispelled the traditional centralization of the empire. So it's a kind of a, you know, halfway solutions are never real solutions, right? Either you, you go thoroughly towards one side. There is a cultural resistance. There is a cultural resistance, of course, from an empire that owes its power, its might, its strength from its own traditions, from its own uh, unicity, right? So aside from the elites, we, we can't think it was some sort of, uh, you know, general... Uh, Roman pride about the the, uh, the the empire, about what it meant, right? But the 11th century is the moment where, as we will see, the, this aspirations of universal power will will fade, simply because if you look at around the empire, there are many other powers that are rising. And at that point, you can be a, a big empire, uh, uh, surely a unique one, etc., but not really the, the only one anymore. This is not the early Middle Ages anymore. This is something different. And uh, there is a surpass. There is a transition. And, and uh, elsewhere, that the Byzantines, in, in some way, this is probably the, you know, the most approximate uh, conceptualization of it, uh, miss, right? Uh, for a set of very complicated circumstances that could have been different, but they have not been. <laughs> so, uh, this is what, at the end, makes history for real. Um, orthodoxy, as we were saying before, was quite important at this point, because uh, early medieval, um, the early medieval empire had been really, really uh, pretty tumultuous in religious terms. Right, that there was, um, aside from the late antiquity, the very beginning of the early Middle Ages, there were, there were even certain sympathies towards uh, certain heterodox, were not openly heretic uh, movements, especially for keeping the Near East uh, and Egypt at bay uh, before it was conquered by the Arabs. Uh, there had been some struggles, there had been some, uh, you know, uh, the, the relation between the empire in the church had never been completely consolidated and and crystallized as we we often say when we talk from a western perspective that there was a struggle between the emperor and the church right uh, objectively in, in, in unlike in the west uh, the Byzantine church was framed under the imperial rule right but it always struggled to to give itself some more autonomous space, uh, and there had been struggles. I mean, again, thinking about uh, the iconoclasm at one point, all the problems. Iconoclasm. I came to study something more, uh, more in depth and very uh, historiographically updated just recently for a conference. Uh, it it has to be rewritten completely. Like uh, the, the 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 traditional Vulgata is is completely. Uh, you know, it's it misses the point. Maybe we have to make a video, a new video, actually, because I already made one on iconoclasm and what it really was. Uh, I have to note this. Uh, so, by the 11th century, instead, these problems have somewhat ended, at least within the, strictly speaking, within the, the Byzantine institutions. There were always theological debates. There were emperors that sat uh, together with, you know, the, the clergy talking about religious matters, etc. But, you know, there were... There were very important uh, debates at a strictly, you know, internal level, politically speaking. But, you know, the orthodoxy had been fully consolidated. Now it's the West that goes astray with um, papal Rome that basically changes its, its face and uh, transforms itself into something completely different from tradition. So the relations are uh, inverted now. So, uh, 
as we were saying before, uh, all this big expansion Macedonian time had brought some uh, draining of resources. Um, and, and, and this is something that is felt, right? Even the, uh, the fact that the empire at the end of the day couldn't uh, resist to the Turkish advance uh, after Manzikert and, uh, you know, speaks for, for a system that probably could have been um, more solid if managed in kind of a, a different ways from the strictly military point of view. It was mostly a political and social problem at that point. Um, and um, this changed the local ge political geography forever. Uh, like, because basically the Byzantines would not be able to fully reacquire the, what they had lost in Asia Minor after after Amanzi heard. Uh, also the Seljuks were bringing something new in the, in the equation, right? They, you know, they 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 had very different views of the world and uh, they were deeply inspired by the same Byzantine Empire. In fact, they called themselves Sultanate of Rome in, in Anatolia because that was the Sultanate of Rome proper. Um, these perspectives are, are also important because uh, they tell you from one side how strong the concept of universalism and being part of, of, of an empire, even if it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, properly, you know, of your own religion. It's not that the Seljuks were trying to, to be Christian in that or be part of the Byzantine Empire, but that they could recognize the fact that Rome was not something like something else. And that they didn't care that the Byzantine Empire was that Rome at this point was properly Christian Rome, right? Uh the the concept is uh it, it's about what Rome means in the first place as an empire, as an imperial model. And also the ability to pose themselves into a kind of a positive fashion towards it. Because if you call yourself the Sultan of Rome, but you're basically saying, you know, even if I'm at this point kind of a small ruler, because it was just, you know, a central part of Anatolia, I still can't compete with these guys. And objectively it was, you know, the Byzantines sweated, uh, albeit some sort of s successful way on average to, to recover part of these territories, but... Uh, there had been a deep break, right? Uh, something had really changed. Uh, uh, the loss of southern Italy, other very important chapter, right? Uh, the, as you know, southern Italy at this point is reunified. Is unified after actually centuries of uh, of political fra dramatic political fragmentation under the secular Normans, right? So these were part of those Western mercenaries, contractors that had come from uh, France, uh, largely Normandy. Uh, but you know when we talk about Normans, especially in southern Italy, the, the whole thing was way more complex. Like. Normans at that point is more a synecdoche to say, you know, these adventures that were predominantly uh, or originally coming from Normandy and that eventually <coughs> were joined by many others. It was a business, right? The Normans had began in there by making the, uh, by escorting pilgrims to the Holy Land through the the roads that from, you know, through Italy brought to the ports for the, for the Holy Land. So, that was their their thing. Uh, uh, even Norman, uh, the Norman conquest of England. At the end of the day, they weren't just Normans. They were Bretons. They were Flemish, together with William the Conqueror. So, man. So, um, it, it's a very complex pattern, but it shows you, however, how vital this new knightly model is. Normans are nice. They they fight in a certain way. They have a certain mindset. They have a certain um, culture. You know, when they the Normans unify first p uh, southern peninsular Italy, and then they d the Pope sends them to conquer Sicily from the Muslims, which they accomplish in something like thirty years. Uh, uh, it was kind of a much longer conquest than the one of England, but also kind of an easier one. And uh, 
that also required much less slaughter uh, afterwards. And uh, the, the, the Normans import into these lands that were traditionally, in fact, kind of a, uh, you know, aside from the Latin element, were, it was, they were the Greek ones, that were the Muslim ones. So uh, they import a French culture, but we can't start to call really French. These guys speak French. They write in the proto-Gothic fashion that, that was the script of the time. They import uh, French titles and feudalism. Western Frankish feudalism is most uh, dramatically advanced form of feudalism that exists out there. So they import a chunk of 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 uh, uh, Frankish culture into the center of the Mediterranean, and they even st strengthen it further because uh, Norman Sicily is the most uh, centralized kingdom. Uh, in uh, in the Latin Germanic High Middle Ages, right, uh, even more than England. Interestingly enough, it's already very very uh, centralized, and in this sense, the Norman legacy is important because they, these Normans were able, basically in 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 one century, to transform themselves from from Vikings into French knights, um, and to be able to replicate and even to enhance the feudal system. It's amazing, right? So, and this is a new aggressive force that is just next door to Greece because, you know, by sea especially, it's not that difficult to move in the Mediterranean. And they become a very, very serious threat. So the Comnenian dynasty for the empire, and, and bear in mind that because uh, the, um, the Byzantine Empire uh, is known by these people. Right, uh, as we were saying before, these guys from uh, from northern, uh, from continental Europe, had served in Byzantine armies for centuries in the Mediterranean. You can find them literally everywhere. Uh, and now they were ever more, and they knew the empire, which meant that they knew what its strengths and weaknesses were, how they could theoretically take it over. And from now on, whoever rules in Sicily, whether it's the Normans or the Swabians or the Angevins, the, the first thing they want to do is to conquer Constantinople. Because at this point, that's really the deal, right? And uh, it's interesting because uh, the Sicilo Norman kingdom is this kind of bastard kingdom. Like the, the French and the Germans look at it saying, you know, these guys are weird. They settled into lands that were ruled by the Muslims. They are kind of more that they were kind of close to, to that world, to, to the Muslims, to the Byzantines, that they are. Um, but they actually are a pole of power. Like Norman Sicily at this point, especially after the, the First Crusade, they own, uh, during the 12th century, they have Sicily, uh, south, uh, southern peninsula Italy. They have a protectorate over t Tunisia. Uh, they own the Principality of Antioch, right? They, they have something that looks very much like a Mediterranean empire of some sort. Um, and they always look at the Byzantines like saying, you know, can we take Constantinople <laughs> now? Um, uh, because that's the, the, the big apple, right? You know, that's what you want to seize for yourself. That's the, the, the most powerful city in there, in the Mediterranean, and you want to, to put your hands on it and on the rest of the empire because it's so well centralized compared to the we this Western Frankish monarchies that have always to struggle with local barons, etc. And, uh, yeah, that's one of the flaws of, of Western feudalism, decentralization. Uh, and that's interesting, in fact, as we were saying before, to note that in the, the Byzantine world with the Pronoia system, something was happening quite similarly to that as well. Uh, also, there is this this idea that by the 11th century, the West was already unequivocally more productive than the Byzantine areas. Like, uh, this is not really true. I mean, if you look at the crop rate in certain areas of Greece, and um, you know, they were pretty high. Like, they, they weren't. You know, the, the, I don't know why there is this prejudice to which the Byzantine Empire wasn't considered as fertile, let's say, as other regions of Western Europe. Well. Surely there were more fertile regions, but 
you know, the whole thing was pretty homogeneous. The, the real problem comes on a co more on a commercial base. And that's where the Italians enter into play. Uh, but uh, we, before passing to that, talking about the Comnenians. The Comnenian dynasty is, as we were saying before, the main protagonists of high medieval Byzantine history, right? They held the empire from the end of the 11th to the end of the 12th century. It's a very important century, the Comnenian one. And this power extends further the imperial boundaries. They recovered the control of large areas of the coasts of Asia Minor, which were very important because they were deeply Hellenized. Right, the, the Asia Minor didn't have really many uh, big centers at this point. Basically, the only true cities, like a solid, you know, kind of universes on their own, are Constantinople and Thessalonica, that has some kind of ambition and uh, municipalism in its veins. It wants to to detach itself a bit from the Constantinopolitan grip. When you look at Asia, Asia Minor, there are much lesser s centuries that, uh, especially after the 11th, uh, after Manzikert had gone, um, had declined, right? There is a collapse of certain trade routes and um, the Turks that launch uh, raids into the territories and stuff like that. But they're deeply Hellenized. They have a solid and anch very ancient Episcopal uh, net. So that's where the the Comnenians start from in many ways to to reconquer like from the coasts that are traditionally speaking since the ancient world had been basically deeply deeply and radically Hellenized especially uh, you know, the major centers that so those were uh, th this is interesting because that um, that makes you reflect also on the mid truly Mediterranean character of the empire, like the Byzantine Empire uh, is has this mm, late antique civilization basically surviving and obviously transforming itself over time but still being based on the ancient, if you want, Hellenic concept that there are cities on the coast and that there is a sort of talassocracy that, telling the truth, in the Byzantine case is not truly really such because and we don't have time to explain it, but let's say the concept is that well, well, there is a video made uh, that is called Byzantine Naval Warfare that talks roughly about these times, and uh, I explain a bit there how basically Byzantine power was a solidly terrestrial power, not really a maritime one, uh, that, it, that it couldn't be otherwise. But the concept that there is a city on the coast that is a fortified center has some local um, artisan production and trades with others and, and connects them, right? And and is in constant contact with the interland that is not Hellenized instead, it's largely something else, it's more local, right? It's the, the agricultural world, not the urban world, but but that, you know, in this uh, ring basically of the city that connects the, the, the interland with the sea and makes trade and taxes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, um, uh, exploited by the empire is, is very important, right? Uh, there is a limit sometimes of the rule, objectively, in the interland of these lands. So, yeah, some of them were settled by different populations, think about the Balkans, for example, uh, how much they had been Slavicized, and uh, think about the Bulgarians, uh, how close they were to the. I made a battle, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a video, <laughs> I made a battle, maybe not, a video about the Battle of Bulgarophagon recently, which I, we talk about it, uh, how powerful and um, even competitive the Bulgarians uh, had been towards the empire, and, you know, and they represent this, instead, more strictly terrestrial power compared to, to, to Constantinople, right? Um, so different worlds, different cultures, uh, but similar dynamics over time that characterize them, their relation. And um, so 
the Comnenians also repelled the Norman aggressions into the Balkanic Peninsula. The, the Normans strike in Epirus, the Battle of the Arachium in 1081. Uh, they take, they, they sack Thessalonica in the 12th century. Uh, so they go very close to Constantinople, right? Uh, probably was not a, from the Normans in particular, not a major threat, but definitely during the Crusades at least, you know, the there was this possibility that a Western army could could arrive in suburbs of Constantinople, especially when there were still land routes. You know, at uh, the First Crusade, uh, even the Second, uh, the Byzantines freaked out. Eventually, Constantinople would be taken from the sea. Um, but now we arrived to Venice in a while. But after all, the Comnenians had managed to to contain the Norman uh, aggressions. They could be very deep strategically. That this is uh, far ranging. Uh, the Normans have a pretty sound military system. They, they they have organized this newly conquered land very very easily because especially Sicily is was Muslim, so they basically raised everything uh, that wasn't telling the truth excessively advanced as somebody think. Many Muslims also came back to Tunisia at one point, but they they the, the Normans in there managed to centralize where whereas into peninsular Italy with all the local traditions, Longobard duchies, and Byzantine cities, that it's, it's a bit more difficult, right? And, and their seafaring, as we have seen, which is not to be given for granted at this point, because the Frankish feudal culture was mostly terrestrial. You know, they, they didn't it's remarkable how much the, biz the the Normans had learned in terms of of seamanship also thanks to the partially to the same uh, maritime tradition of the uh, autonomized Byzantine principalities of southern Italy that had provided you know most of the crews and, and ships and knew how to operate them which most Normans probably weren't particularly keen on. Uh, that's also why they, sometimes the Normans are considered like the bastards of the situation, because they mingle with elements that for a typically Frankish culture would have been deemed as inferior, right? The commoners, blah, what are those? In feudal culture, they're, they're worth less than nothing. And instead they're very important. Uh, especially of all, this urban cent fortified centers in southern Europe are you know, there's a strong urbanization. You need infantry. You need logistics. You need something, to, not just open plains where you can make a clash between heavy cavalry. You, you need a lot of other uh, uh, strategic and tactical assets to, to cope with that, and the Normans adapt very cleverly. Uh, uh, however, as we were saying before, especially uh, after Manzikert, uh the empire was reduced to, at this point, of mostly a Balkanic block, right? Traditionally speaking, the, the core of, of the empire up to Manzikert had been Asia Minor. Now that's lost. Just the coasts uh, are still in Byzantine hands. So now it's the Balkans that make for, for most of the landmass of the empire uh, and um, and this had this region had been troubled as we were saying before uh, first of all by the Bulgarians that got annihilated by Basil II but were technically still there right and in fact after the fourth crusade they would pop out once again as, as a power on their own um, but also other movements uh, like the Bogomil and Polisian um, proselytism that were quite of a threat. Basically, these were all uh, Neoplatonic uh, heresies very similar to the one of the Cathars in southern France and certain even Shia movements in the in the Muslim world. Uh, that. Uh, and it's interesting to trace this parallelism because it, it makes you understand that in different civilizations that there were kind of similar 
trends in terms of orthodoxy and heterodoxy, right? In the West now, the orthodoxy was the papacy that supported, in fact, the main political establishment. The Catars are heretics, sometimes are... Uh, well, there is a bit of invention of what the Catars actually were to, in order to justify the crusade against them, but there were all these heresies spread uh, in, in France and Italy, in Germany, that were quite of a trouble and were anti-establishment fundamentally. Uh, and they had all this cultural background. So, in fact, there is an hypothesis that even these groups shared uh, transcontinentally some, some sort of know-how, knowledge, etc. Uh, the Byzantines had the Polishans and the Bogol mills that obliged the... Um, basically, the Byzantines to carry out what can be properly called the only true crusade into Byzantine history, because at that point they, they are such a consistent force in the Balkans, they hide in the mountains in these places there, you really need the army to take them out. They're dangerous, they're armed, it's not just about religion, it's also about auto autonomization, so uh, the Byzantines do not go easy on them, they, 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 they massacre them, but they, they are still this looming threat, you know, those are, you can kill people, but killing ideas is quite of a different story. The same caliphate, you know, you have the Sunni, uh, the, the Basque caliphate st the still formally exists under the, the control of the Seljuks. There are the main Sunni established political power. Uh, and then there are all these Shia elements that hide. In fact, even in there, in the, in the Persian plateau and sometimes in these rocks, the like, uh, think about the Ismailites, the, the famous assassins that have all of this neoplatonic training and um, very exoteric approach to reality. Well, this is strikingly similar, both in the Western Christian and Byzantine and in the Islamic worlds, right? Uh, everybody has its own problems, right? Uh, and yet, the, probably the most important element that cannot be stopped now is the combined power of uh, Crusader knights and Italian merchants, right? These are the truly uh, strongest Western force for interpretive reality, for uh, economical and military forces that they can't put into play, right? Uh, the Byzantines do not have the same degree of economical of, of uh, commercial dynamism of these powers. Uh, crusaders, um, crusader knights are this massive, uh, you know, considering their, their effective power numbers, quantity of, of heavy cavalry units that march together in this incredibly well-ordered uh, Military expeditions take the first crusade. It's, it's, it's astonishing how people coming from places like Belgium that had never m maybe even heard of, of places like Syria <laughs> or uh, other regions of the Near East were able to mount an expedition with that degree of efficiency, of coordination, of organization that would bring to, to the conquest of Jerusalem. Uh, and they passed through Constantinople, right? And... The Italian merchants, these are really the guys that, uh, you know, the Crusades basically sh shift um, over time from the land route to the uh, sea route because the Italians at this point are well connected with the Crusader states and they ship the Crusader armies that do not have uh, sh fleets on their own. Um, and the, they, they, they pay the Italians to be shipped uh, overseas. And uh, the Italians put a lot of uh, know-how. They, they know the history for, for quite a while. They're, they're on the lead for technological advancements, the military, etc. Uh, they have crossbows and trebuchet. They're the pioneer their 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 exploit, the, their, uh, their development. Uh, the, uh, they, uh, they have this extremely aggressive-minded attitude towards uh, commercial business. They, they they are extremely competitive, ferociously competitive, first of all among each other, but against everybody who puts themselves in their way. So they attack the coastal centers of all the Mediterranean, they settle in there, doesn't matter whether it's Christian, whether it's uh, Muslim, obviously they, they try to deal with them first and just directly aggressing. Because they 
are the guys who literally shift all the wealth from east to west and vice versa, right? And they're pretty damn useful for, for powers that need money fast. But in exchange, they, they, they are settled in these uh, citadels. In Usually, the, the Italian quarter is um, a city within the portal city. It's basically its own port that is, is impregnable from the sea because the Italian navy is too strong for any of these powers. Uh, basically, there is no such a thing like a permanent fleet, but all, all of these Italian maritime republics have uh, constantly uh, tens and tens of galleys available because of all the merchants that work in here. So every once in a while, the city says, okay, we need, the government says, you know, we need this uh, number of, of galleys to, to fight at war. So they basically have all these assets uh, immediately readily available. And they settled in the Byzantine Empire as well. And the Byzantines do not have the mer the, the interpreting reality, the, 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 the merchant classes that the Italians have. The Italians develop um, in the center in the north because the south is being choked by the Norman feudalism, uh, albeit it had seen some of the, the, the earliest rise of maritime republics before that, uh, uh, in, in two cities that are basically autonomous. Uh, they're even able to fight and defeat the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, they have virtually unlimited resources at one point. There are too many. There are like tens and tens of fortified cities. At they they they're not all maritime powers, of course, but uh, the main maritime republics are pretty strong, and you need their support if you want to mo want to move into Mediterranean. Venice is the uh, friend of the Byzantines, right? But are uh, there are other centers like Genoa and Pisa, for example, that, in fact, side with different powers according to this. And uh, Venice is technically... So th they, they have, first of all, I, I was completing the sentence that uh, there is no authority in, in, in the Italic kingdom that can tell these guys what they have to do. So they overly expand. They don't have to pay taxes. They They... They invest continuously in trade, and they rise and rise and rise. In the Byzantine Empire, there is nothing like this. Society is much more, uh, it's much less mobile. Uh, it has a strongly agricultural character. There, there, there are very few cities, as we've seen, that have a relatively low uh, entrepreneurial uh, capacity compared to the Italians. But we've seen the benefits that settling the Italians has for the empire because it means having uh, a community that puts you into connection with all the, the largest international traffics it makes you uh, you know profit from that with taxes and all so they're very important but they, they also want their share so there is this in inherent tension between the, the, the Italians and the Byzantine authorities Sometimes, as you know, in the 12th century, that also escalates into the massacre of the Latins in, at Constantinople in other um, ports of the empire. But uh, it's a bit of the same old story. Like, they, yeah, they, they, they are act all offended at the beginning, but you know, when they need to trade once again, that they trade, and there are compensations. So there is a kind of an inconstant policy, also from the Byzantine side, that sometimes it was not very clever because. Uh, the the Italians don't forget certain things, <laughs> and uh, and eventually they will take their you know it's Vene Venetian ships that that take Constantinople so that that's that's quite of a uh, a revenge at the end of the day, and um, the, the, all they're interested is in profit, like they don't care like the Venetians uh, since a very early age trade constantly with the, the Egyptians as well. With the Muslims, they make a lot of money with uh, selling weapons coming from Lombardy or from Germany, uh, selling wood and slaves coming from uh, the the Slavic Balkans, and they sell them to everybody. and And the Pope tries uselessly to tell to do not sell, do not sell. They keep doing it. And and this poses the the Venetians especially uh, in kind of s sort of favorable terms with, with with the Byzantines because at the end of the day, uh, uh, Venice is a bit this island, literally like Venice is, is basically impregnable by any 
conventional force at the time, unless it's not another uh, maritime power, right? Um, and uh, because of this peculiar geographical position. And they, they're technically part of the empire. Like originally speaking, I made a video of Byzantine Italy, when the one talking about the Venetian lagoons, that explains a bit how Venice rose. So Venice was an extremely recent cities, uh, city, like all the other maritime republics were ancient centers. The Venice proper starts developing from the from the early mid high Middle Ages, right? It emerges in the ninth century, more or less, in these lagoons, and uh, it's because there is a, a Byzantine officer in there. The Dux Veneticorum, which means the leader, the yeah, the, the commander of the of the Venetians, technically, of the Veneti proper, like in Latin, like, and it progressively autonomizes itself. Um, and theoretically, however, it happens still within the the imperial borders. In fact, Venice, Venice does not belong to the to the Holy Roman Empire, in spite they ha they have very strict, uh, I mean, excuse me, very close relations with it, but uh, it's a world that exploits this kind of frontier dimension. For example, the Venetians are completely uninterested in land acquisitions, they just want ports and ports and ports. Uh, in fact, even when they conquer Constantinople with the French, they do not take land proper, like, they want only the ports, because technically speaking, they uh, uh, they 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 had agreed they would take basically one third of the land, of the empire, but they leave it all to the French. Then, in fact, settle in there and pretend to apply uh, Western feudalism into Byzantine society. It doesn't doesn't quite work well, and they start killing themselves among each other and all the, all the various remnants of the Byzantines and with other Balkanic populations. So uh, it's a big mess. Venice stays out, just makes you know, money quite massively. Uh, and and they need a fleet. I mean the, the excuse me, the Byzantines do need a fleet at this point. Uh the Byzantines were famous because of their fleet since ever, basically, since the time of the of an, of antiquity and however that costed a lot. Uh, the, the empire was in shortage of resources, chronically speaking. So, the fleet, um, maintaining a permanent fleet like it was in the Byzantine tradition, uh, wasn't very sensible. Well, so at times, the Venetians were always there, so they, they decided at one point to reduce their um, galleys to, to adopt the Venetian uh, ones. And uh, that would backfire on the longer, and especially in later times, because this continues over and over. But the the, the idea is uh, it's, it's still clever. You know, you need, it's a very, uh, you know, much more dynamical way of considering your assets, right? In a world that is already very unpredictable by itself, but that pushes you not, in fact, to stick to kind of unflexible uh, systems, but rather something you can change very quickly according to the situation and earning money in the process. So, uh, yeah, this, however, is already showing some sort of weakness from the Byzantine side, because the Italians at this point do not have just this availability. They also have the best galleys. They have the best crews, right? These guys work, live on them, <laughs> basically. So the, 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 they're true professionals in many ways, and they, they're extremely functional in this. They're very well organized, and um, that's that they dominate the Mediterranean in many ways. So uh, it becomes difficult for the Byzantines to, to become autonomous from from a maritime, political point of view. What kept Venice so close to? to to Constantinople at this time was not just the evident interest that derived from, you know, uh, exporting uh, the, the Byzantine uh, goods, but also the fact that the Normans, who were Byzantine enemies in general, this potentially, uh, uh, were very dangerous because they had some 
maritime capability on their own, as we've seen, and they they control the Alternto Strait. Uh, and controlling the Alternto Strait means that um, they are. I mean, it's, it's not a complete control like you had to arrive uh, in the 19th century for having uh, a fleet that actually can stop, uh, you know, crossing a certain surface of sea. Uh, this is still not like that, but it's still there is a big attrition involved if if the Normans decide to stop Byzantine, sh uh, excuse me, uh, Venetian ships because that chokes the Adriatic Sea where where the where Venice is, and uh, the Venetians have always worked in order to weaken sensibly whoever controlled that land because uh, that was a precondition to to um, to 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 keep that way or that straight open. In fact, even in later later Middle Ages, the Venetians that are also kind of a much stronger state at that point try even to seize certain enclaves along the Adriatic coast in southern Italy to, to keep that space open. Right. But for now, being allied with with Constantinople provides you with at least the a, a very powerful ally that can you can count on relatively to that matter specifically. Um, what else to say? Uh, the Byzantine Empire in this period remains definitely a uh, cultural superpower. Um, cultural activity was very intense. Uh, there are very important pieces of literature. Think about Michael Psellos or uh, the same Anna uh, Komnena or um, well there is a lot, you know, historiography uh, for later sources, think about the end, uh, Niketas Coniates, right, and uh, even uh, Fautius uh, back in the day wrote uh, a lot of stuff, they had a lot of letters, tell us so much. Uh, in that, the Byzantines remained really an authority, and that's where they draw also most of their sense of, of identity, of unity, right? Uh, it's this Christian church Roman state and Hellenic culture. This is what really distinguish Byzantine identity and it defines it properly. Um, and um, so, in spite of this, that remains a bit like the flag of Byzantine identity of the empire. Yes, the uh, incapability, however, um, to exercise effectively like one time the function of fulcrum of a power of universal aspiration right um, that had been the sap for the support of imperial ideology traditionally so uh, in this world where you think you have emerged, think it in, even in perspective now, we know how it's gone, but think how difficult it is to change from a past, that, you know, where you are basically the only empire, right? There is not a, a, a rival here, and then uh, still, but the concept is that there are so many other powers around now that they don't even care about you, they just simply as an enemy, like all the others, they don't think you are uh, literally the, the legitimate emperor. Right, even the, the the Holy Roman Emperors, at this point, yeah, they always try to, you know, to be recognized by the Byzantines as their peers because they they are true the Roman, they they are the, the true Roman emperors and so on. But at the same time, we're not in the early Middle Ages anymore. This is not an immense power that, in comparison of which the Roman Germanic kingdoms are kind of a, you know, very, uh, very weak. Uh, this is a very different scenario have extremely aggressive enemies coming especially from the west to start not caring about you like the crusaders do not care that you are the roman emperor uh, uh, the, the, the italians just think about making money they don't give a damn about you in the first place uh, the, the holy roman emperors the other kings they, they, are, they have business on their own yeah okay the empire is important it's a very important partner uh, still uh, up to the um, the thirteenth century uh, the the empire remains the uh, a major power that changes all the international relations and can support this or, th or that policy in the west 
never think that uh, the Byzantines didn't play at this point in uh, Western policies. They were very important, even the balance between uh, the, the Italian, uh, the Lombard League and the 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 Hohenstaufen, um, they they have a very big uh, influence also in other monarchic histories at this point. Um, and, and on the Crusader states, uh, really, and also in the Muslim world, of course, they they are very um, far-ranging, and this is objectively still an enormous power. Even just geographically speaking, in spite of all the, its reductions and how they they had occurred, that you know, controlling those areas, um, it, it, it's real meaningful, right? There is even a, an ability now to frame, to to take away lands from Hungary. We have seen it on the Danubian frontier. The the, the, the Hungarians start, you know, the, the Byzantines are. Uh, arrive up to Croatia at this point, at least in terms of, you know, more or less direct political control. And uh, these are m this is a meaningful expansion, especially the Balkanic dimension is important now, because that's the one that that is more solid, that is more difficult to take away, right? Um, it's very difficult to take away from the Byzantines now the Balkanic interland. Uh, also, the major waves of peoples um, expanding are it's kind of over, right? From the steppes, I mean, uh, all these avalanches of nomadic populations, they, they have a relative impact at this point. And uh, who does conquer the Balkans, objectively? It takes t too much resources. It's a very tough land. And the Byzantines themselves are, you know, they have this immediate strategic advantage being in the Balkans proper, like Constantinople is, but also having this older, uh, you know, uh, ancient connection with the Balkanic world. I mean, Hellenic civilization always had very strong contacts with the areas up to the Carpathians, up to the Danube, you know. Um, they weren't new there, right? And while other powers, of, uh, you know, other regions, in fact, are much more difficult to to control. In fact, they get lost relatively easily, or at least there are more daring enterprises to, 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 to conquer them in the first place and to maintain them eventually. So, yeah, so I, I hope this gives a bit of a broader picture of the problem. That the Empire is, is expanding, but critically, right? At the point that um, there is a sort of crazy run to for, for for spending, right? If you don't spend, you save, and you don't have readily available military to to counter the enemies that at that point will will invade you, because if you you don't push forward, they 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 don't stay on the defensive either, um, and uh, so it's. Uh, it's a mechanism that sometimes we we tend to explain by blaming this or that direction, but sometimes they really didn't have much option, much of an option. You have to expand because as long as you expand, you can keep for now some form of income, in spite of all the uh, you know the fact that you consume also lots of resources. But at that point, the state does exactly that. It needs to levy troops. To have, uh, hopefully, a uh, you know, pretty uh, central elite core of the army, and then other levies that they can uh, send around. It's sending these stronger armies here and there. It, it's a quite of an enterprise. Like the, there is a lot of war, but objectively, sending these troops, um, especially the mobile army here and there, it's extremely expensive and. It regularly, you know, you don't have an, an enormous amount of armies at your disposal. You, you have to uncover uncover certain fronts. So it's a continuous political and diplomatical game in which also internal matters uh, have an influence, as always. So it, it's really a mess, and 
I wouldn't, uh, I surely don't envy a uh, Byzantine emperor <laughs> in general for all the responsibilities and the difficulties and uh, all you know, life attempts, you know, <laughs> killing attempts, sorry. Uh, yeah, that happened even within the same court, <laughs> so whatever, the, let's quit it here. Um, just for now, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.